It's canopy now. No sun caresses the gnarled concrete that masquerades as sidewalk. A sidewalk I navigated effortlessly as a child as my reality avoided the reality of others. An avoidance that was destined to clash at some point, which has clashed for an entire life, which clashes even on this day as my steps fall upon the shaded concrete that tunnels nervously under the branches that guard the avenue of my youth. There's nothing to find in the dwellings of my life, nothing to find in the home of my withering parents who still wage their daily war in the name of God and a paycheck that will provide them the food and clothes necessary to maintain their war for another week. Jesus loves me, this I know. I know. I know. How many times I've heard that? How many times I've heard everything? How many rosaries must one person have? The rituals consuming minutes, hours, years, lives. Isn't once enough? He only died once. Never again in my home will such words be spoken. They never were. So many words left unspoken. So many thoughts, feelings, emotions left to tumble into the abyss of my soul. Yet somehow they took hold. They found a cavern in which to hide and germinate, a tortured home in which to grow, a home so remote I was unaware of their presence until they finally grew so big they couldn't avoid infringing upon my consciousness. A consciousness that had been so inundated with virgin mothers, our fathers, Lord's prayers, and a total absence of spirituality as to be nearly unable to function outside religion's realm. Did you say your prayers? Yes, I said my prayers. I went to mass, I confessed my sins. I did everything I was supposed to do so many times, our God must be sick of me. And he must be sick of the endless prattle that floods over him. The mouths convinced that if they just perform enough rituals, all will be well. All I wanted was to be happy. But my happiness had to coincide with making sense out of the world. Order out of the chaos being something my father never demanded, but I was demanding. I demanded answers, explanations, reasons. Only too often my timidly ventured questions were answered with, we have to accept it on faith, or that's just the way it is, or God has his reasons. That was never enough for me. I wanted answers. And in my quest to find them, I began to feel ever more like Galileo, with my father playing the role of Paul V, my mother betraying a dismayed Mary. My questions became increasingly less frequent. It was my silence that restored my parents' faith in me, my seeming compliance viewed as a strengthening of my beliefs. But my silence was merely an attempt to put an end to my mother's exasperated looks, to my father's burgeoning wrath. My father's life had been an odyssey of early risings, long hours, calloused hands, grease-smeared clothes, howling machinery, and rapacious voices ever competing with the machines. His thick hands had once been a comfort to me. They were the hands that would scoop me up to give me a good night hug, the hands that would press a quarter into my palm to put into the offering plate, my tiny fingers trembling at the thought of what might happen should the plate fall from them, the hands that patted me on the back when I'd bring home my report card. They were the hands that executed repeated tasks over and over so I might have food to eat and a place to live. Yet they were also the hands that imprisoned my father. For they were so adept, my father slowly allowed his intellect to atrophy, to become something he seldom trusted, preferring instead to rely on learned instincts and physical force to get him by. By the time I was old enough to look at him with comprehension, his eyes had become brackish pools as bereft of life as a stagnant, acidic lake. How could that be? It's very explicit in the Bible. What about all loving, all forgiving? He is all loving and all forgiving to those who profess, but to those who don't proclaim him as Lord, he is wrathful. One need only see how God dealt with the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Hivites to see that treating some people with wrath is the only just way to treat them. But those people had heard of God and chosen not to accept him. What about those who never heard of him? They too will feel his wrath. So I prayed. I prayed three times a day every day for God to forgive those who led virtuous lives but had never heard his name. Three times a day every day for my all-loving God to have mercy on the ignorant. Torrents unabated. Day after day, pounding, beating, thrashing, pushing me under, pulling me deeper. The iron wrath surrounding me, engulfing me. The pain, torture, and confusion, a daily ritual as I gasped for air. The vain instincts of my body clutching in survival, reaching out, grasping at ledges and crevices that didn't exist as waves of mandated penitence rolled over me. All I wanted was peace, to drift unaccosted, or at the very minimum to be afflicted as Charlemagne, blessed with a vision that would sustain me through an entire life marauding in the name of Christ. Always were perceptions skewed. 
My quiet struggles with understanding viewed as apathy. My indignation with subtle atrocities viewed as humor. My lighthearted attempts to temporarily free myself of these social change perceived as a sarcastic innuendo of a raging young fool, caught between a virulent sky that unleashed its tears in an onslaught of turmoil and a swirling abyss of anguish, fear, and anxiety that was unrelenting in its inhalation that I scraped and fought to resist. Years of acquiescence and complacence coming to an end. But that end would not come gently. Quietly. River simmering heaved under the pounding, its intestines wretched at themselves from incessant violence, immune to nature's fury, succumbing to man's. As restless the night as it was during the day, the sun forever pre vernal, the once lucid eyes of the river now an opaque brown, polluted by the verbiage of Pharisees, zealous saints, all of them the same at heart. Jesus only cares about us because he pities us. How pathetic are we, so convinced of our righteousness, of the special place in heaven set aside for us. When are you going to get a real job? Why don't you make something? Again and again these phrases were repeated, always the tone accusatory, income confused with success, knowing I wanted something more, or at least something different. Could Hobbes have been right? Are we the selfish beasts he said we are, destined to continue in our rampage against our world, our lives? I had been bombarded with original sin my entire life. It flooded over me every time I prayed. It's no wonder Locke was called a heretic by my church, the church of indulgences and the inquisition, of Sunday worship and the deification of Mary. So full of wisdom, forgiveness, peace, love. He would not have condemned Sodom. He would have forgiven Gomorrah. He was someone truly worthy of worship, casting no stones, perfect love revealed through the perfect word. My doubts and questions of the previous years becoming inconsequential as waves of mercy undulated over me. Finally, I had found the answers I sought. I had known them all along, but these answers required desperation to be revealed. A desperation that had rendered me a vacant, enraged soul that prayed and believed only because I was afraid not to. A soul that listened to my father's orations on religion, working, and success. His views absolute, ancient, given legitimacy by their antiquation and mass appeal. His lectures bereft of spirituality and understanding. You could be a sage or a mentor, but what are you? You're a religious macaw and a television programming guide. Through Matthew and Mark, through Luke and into John, wrapped in serenity and lofty dizziness, thrilling not so much in believing I was redeemed, but at the thought of redemption beginning, of a friendship long taken for granted and finally renewed, betrayed, crucified, risen, walking the earth again but not ascending, not yet, performing miracles, Thomas touching his hands, his side, back to Mark, betrayed, crucified, risen, ascended, no time for more miracles, no time for Thomas, the tale's not just different, but contradictory, the disciples spin doctors, playwrights, could Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John be the Shakespeare, Dickens, Joyce, and mom of their time, inspiring and manipulating the crowds as the mood struck them, claiming inspired perfection as anyone could? Would it make as much sense to worship the redeemed Ebenezer Scrooge, or Lady Macbeth, or Billy Pilgrim? Would it make as much sense to worship Alexander the Great, or Socrates, or William Henry Harrison? We scoff at mythology, but wouldn't the Greeks delight in tales of gods and mortals riding chariots across the sky, stopping the earth from rotating, living in a whale's belly, bringing the dead into the world of life? All of these stories, the same. Jesus, no less a god than Apollo. Jupiter, no less a god than Jehovah. Gautama, Gandhi, or Confucius. Thoreau on a par with Muhammad. The Iker of Zeus as redeeming as the blood of Christ. Almost a dream, the line. Indecipherable, black melting into black. No shadows, impossible without light absent for so long. The path unseen, mysterious in the spiraling void that confuses the unconscious with the conscious, reality with illusion. See how the night wind changes the world, how it stirs the dust and alters the grass and leaves. The wind, I understand, it moves through the darkness, unafraid of what knowledge will bring. Intellect not to be feared. All of it is delusion. Spectres masquerading as reality, entering the dimly lit ballroom in the guise of politics and capitalism. Their masks, the hideous contortions of goats and wolves, the flesh stripped away to leave only the demented skulls, the wolves stopping to bay at the moon when it emerges from the clouds that grow thick in the sky, the goats twisted in their attitudes of self-centeredness, reveling in the dark corners of the ballroom, taking the food and spirits to these corners to devour in an orgy of personal satisfaction, their voices thick with blood and the stench of devoured flesh. Forget happiness and all the forms you think it takes, for every one of them is a lie. Born to lead the masses into realms of chaos, while the Wall Street masters of deception rejoice over the people's stupidity and celebrate the exploitation they so easily carry out. What buffoons they are, so easily raped and robbed, and then they ask for more. They plead to their masters for more exploitation, doing anything to feed their habits, working 40, 50, 60 hours a week at jobs they abhor, at jobs that strip them of their dignity and deprive them of their health, turning over their meager harvest as soon as the raping is done. Teach your children to heed these principles. Bludgeon and batter them every day into submission. Continue the cycle uninterrupted, not just for weeks and years, but for generations and centuries. 
John the Baptist prophesying the birth of the immaculately conceived industrial revolution. This can't be the result of billions of years of evolution, people shouted at first. But it was. And as soon as the few outcries had been silenced, the revolution was embraced. It filled souls with joy and contentment. Finally, a calling had gone out to all people that would deliver each of them out of the misery of serfdom and slavery, a can of rotted meat on every table. Heaven within their reach, if only they serve their emerging gods a little more devoutly. Nothing ever changes. Even after billions of revolutions and revolutions, everything is the same. Oppression manifested in a thousand forms on every street. Fear sleeping in the unconscious, constantly being roused by glimpses into the unknown and fragments of words, by long forgotten injustices suddenly recalled and even more quickly banished. Fear snarl and glower, fangs bared and claws poised, furiously ignored, but to ignore doesn't expel. So within they live, growing and multiplying, plunging daggers into souls, withdrawing the dripping blade and letting the blood drop onto a devouring tongue that refuses appeasement. Thoughts flow untied, unchained, liberated, coming and going, leaping from shadow to shadow, daring to be acknowledged. I know where these thoughts lead, where these manifestations of lust, injustice, and curiosity will take me. Down the spiraling, darkened stairwell on unsteady feet that bleed for a ray of light as I follow the stairs into the chasm. Fearful of what will be found there, my steps taking me down, the voices of men slowly growing louder, their faces finally coming into view, shrouded by a distant, light-giving fire that burns hidden by so many walls and hallways. The men engaged in the raping of women, the murdering of cows, the preaching of a gospel, mighty Allah having long ago abandoned the first Sagan who reside in this dungeon. Let me roam the balcony, filled with strange and unfamiliar faces, unwilling to allow the uninitiated even a moment of acceptance. The outsider left to move languidly through a frozen realm, begged pleas and outraged rantings viewed the same, scorned, every seat cold and uncomfortable. All that is left is to lie down and allow the ravens and crows to feast on my entrails, but I am afraid of even that, of what such a non-act would yield. An entire life of insignificant moments. The most vivid, those fraught with pain and terror. The pain and terror always alleviated, yet still they fill me with fear. Such ignorance, amazing in a beast who's managed to de-evolve so much. Entire lives spent relinquishing the self to whatever religion might pass, while the few truly extraordinary are banished to asylums and cardboard dwellings, labeled as heretics and fiends. How willingly the stones are cast, hurled with no more thought than is given a Hail Mary. All forms of enlightenment viewed as the voice of Satan, the condemned victims of hunger and hell. Entire lives spent deaf and blind, refusing to see and be abandoned, to cry the tears of the forsaken and deceived. The avenue is littered with angry streaks of light and the remains of humans. High above, the night fights for recognition, the mass is afraid of it and the beauty it hides. The glowing windows revealing the shapes of men sitting hunched over desks, refusing to leave, refusing to believe they are something other than their work, their selves, foreign screaming entities clamoring for attention, haunting their sleep every night for decades until they are the master, their existence still unrecognized, yet determining every act, thought, genuflection. I pity the serfs who toil an entire lifetime in their quest to overcome the unconquerable foe. Rage will be their constant companions, their minds deluded by a lifetime of Sundays and dreams of a future that does not exist, praying for its impossible arrival, feeling nothing but animosity towards the Good Samaritan for having established such a rigorous precedent. I rate with the Sermon on the Mount for its bleeding heart sentiment. It will be long before they leave the warmth of their confused offices to venture out into the night. And when they finally do, it will be on trepid feet that they move, their steps quickly gaining pace until they are hidden within the vehicle that will speed them to their next illusion. Yet I walk on, oblivious to the cold and to the prostitutes who call to me. They are nothing, as is the cold, as are my thoughts, as is myself. Why do they profess? Is it to reserve a place in heaven or to gain a spot on the board of directors? Their entire lives haunted by Dorian Gray, ignorant of his presence penetrating their unconscious, manifesting daily so the selling of Christ can be executed again and again. Such a destitute species, not even trying to pass through the needle's eye. The lips of Mother Teresa, the veneer of Jefferson, the heart of Franco, keeping all for themselves except for the weekly dollar dropped into the plate, absolving all sin. Let him wander for 40 years, the words of Marx and the Christ hidden, sustaining himself on the dream of a mild pension that will support his lusts for television and junk food. 
how easily he is appeased, how easily the shepherd gathers him, how docilely he completes his tasks, how forgettable his existence, how alone the night that torments him by reflecting his life, that inhales his soul deep into its lungs, unable to force life into him, left to roam frustrated and angry through the darkness, decades of toil and desperation bringing a dozen tears and nothing more. Can it be that I will be as forgotten and tormented as he? Forsaken, not by the hand that could have pulled me out of the devouring pit, but by the soul that could have given me a single glimpse of eternity. In the arms of the blackened corridor am I carried, lured by the essence of a freedom that could never be found in a state that revolves on the axis of exploitation, praising a god they ignore and would abhor if they only knew what he really taught, preaching hatred, intolerance, and the offering plate, taunt the serfs with a few scattered kopecks, just enough to make them think they are grateful for the altruism. Mussolini and Reagan laughing at their remains. The king had stood over me, his eyes glaring, vacant of pity, his gavel poised and ready to strike. Your words are heresy, your sins unpardonable. Already slipping, falling, the faint light growing dimmer, rushing further away, my arms grasping, reaching in vain efforts. But it was I who was deceived. It was I who was abandoned. The gavel sounded. Spiraling into oblivion, nothing to grasp, hatred and anger my escorts, deceived, lied to, chaos beating me, pummeled by confusion, the torture of desertion intense, devastated by abandonment. Someone reach out a hand for I am dying and then I die again, each death more hideous than the last. Deeper and deeper the darkness, so passionate as to inflict agony, my arms flailing, my eyes blinded, Guarnica still burning, the hissing cries of those sent before me clawing, tearing at my ears, the next dawn a millennium away. The insolent lights of the skyscrapers and freeways echo in the distance. The animals warm in their caves, their bodies bloated from too many mashed potatoes and jellied cranberries, spending entire lives going from one intoxicant to another, the object of life to be entertained, their existence reduced to stupefaction. All that awaited me was a slow death filled with agony and jealousy of the masses who have enough sense to go to school, get jobs, get married, have kids, join the PTA, go to church, get promoted, become grandparents, retire, and die. There is no salvation. There are only lies in all of their manifestations. But man has to have gods. He's too afraid of himself without them. So if we must have gods, let us worship Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, and Morgan. They are the only hope for humankind. Let us worship them without remorse, consuming without regard, devouring the planet in the name of capitalism until we are plunged into oblivion. The humans left with no resources, devoured by the earth, leaving only a solitary man and a solitary woman to repopulate the world, their children allowed to grow up free from religion. And if they must have religion, let them stumble upon a forgotten library and discover Tolstoy as the father, Thoreau as the son, and Faulkner as the Holy Ghost. The scent, thin and sweet, pulls me closer, filling my body. Past a door that hides blood-drenched voices crying out for forgiveness and mercy. The voices, the echoes of the ignorant who sacrificed their firstborn and their only siblings to Patton and MacArthur in exchange for the freedom to waste without thought. Past a door that hides the silent screams of those who turn to Mother Russia, looking past the hypocrisies of Khrushchev and Stalin and into the eyes of Tolstoy and Pushkin. Past a door that conceals Christmas gifts spread around a television. Past a door that hides pulpits dripping with blood and silver. Past a door that hides cowering idiots who conceal their faces in dark corners, refusing to open their eyes in fear of the pain it will cause. Past a door that hides a cup of warm water and a bowl of cold rice. Past a door that hides an institutionalized proselyte who paces back and forth, repeating his catechism. Past a door that hides a dozen naked women pleading for a sexual fix. Past a dozen, a hundred more until I come to the one door that stands open, revealing a single burning candle. Rapid steps bring me near, leaning in, I'm move closer still, feeling its faint warmth, staring at its tiny glow. With a single breath, it's gone.